coffee is basically grown in this belt around the uh, equator and you'll actually see that a lot of the producing countries are the same that have some of the lowest BNP per capita. Most of the coffee worldwide is produced by smallholders, so that can be a family maintaining a small plot of land. So it's definitely countries that need money, that need your input from the, the exports. I think for me personally, there's, uh, there's something so exciting about coffee in the way that you're also part of the process. You have to brew that coffee yourself, so you're part of the equation. And I think that what makes coffee so interesting is that it's so complex that you have all these things going on at farm level. But again, come time to brewing, there's, there's so many variables that, that makes it really exciting. And I think that for me is a great joy in, in sort of sharing some of the knowledge I have about how to get the most out of the beans with, with just regular people brewing at home. I think at the core for us of founding this company was really to try and bring more value to farmers in producing countries. I think that there's a beauty to that, that you can enjoy your cup of coffee without having a bitter aftertaste. We're Coffee Collective. This is our climate story. My name is Klaus Thompson. I'm a co-founder of Coffee Collective in Copenhagen, Denmark. Coffee Collective is a micro roastery with its own import of green beans directly from farmers, as well as six coffee shops in Copenhagen and a bakery called Collective Bakery. We were founded in 2007 and we set up our company with a very clear goal in mind that we wanted to fix a broken coffee market. Even though prices were rising for consumers in the western part of the world, farmers in the producing countries were getting less and less money for their coffee, actually below cost of production in many cases. We thought that was absurd in the way that we said there's enough value created in the consuming countries that there should be value we could bring out to farmers in the other end. So we set up our, our roastery Pretty small in the beginning, but buying directly from farmers and have continued that path through the last 15 years. Coffee is, is grown in very mountainous regions most of the time. And the way we meet farmer can be on, on many different ways. Sometimes it's going to a country and literally start tasting different coffees and then seeing what's interesting and then go to visit them. Other times we might have heard about someone doing something really interesting in a country. Uh, we've even had farmers reaching out to us through Instagram, showcasing their beautiful ripe red hand-picked cherries, being astonished about the quality of that and then go to visit them. And uh, this is how we met Akmel Nouri in Ethiopia, for example. And we've been working with him for, I think, nine years already. A lot of times farmers are just stuck as these anonymous people. We want to bring them to the forefront. We want to show that they're the people behind this product, which is why on our backs you'll see the name of the farm or the producer in very big letters, and you won't even see our name as Coffee Collective on the front of the back. That's hidden on the side, because we really think that we're, we're just a transportation, we're a, a means to get that coffee out, but it is the farmers who have been responsible for producing that quality to begin with. One of the farmers we work with is uh, Edwin Martinez in Guatemala. They have a farm there called Finca Vista Hermosa, which means the farm of the beautiful view. And that's actually a farmer who reached out to me actually before we started our company. And we've been buying from them for now going on 15 years. That relationship has been incredibly meaningful and to, to both of us. For us, it's been amazing to see that we have customers coming into our shops, not just asking for a Guatemalan, but for Finger de Vista Hermosa. And for Edwin, it's also meant that we have been there through good times and bad times. They have been able, with the money we pay, to invest back into the farm and back into the people working on the farm. And I think one of the, the pressure points, you can say, for our relationship was a few years back when all of Latin America experienced a huge outbreak of what is called coffee leaf rust. It's a fungus that attacks the leaf of the coffee cherries. At Finca Vista Mosa, they went from exporting 400 bags to only 40 bags in one year. Obviously, the quality as well were hurt by that drop in total harvest. We decided that year to say, oh, we'll buy all of your coffee and we'll pay a higher price to help you get through this crisis. Of course, it means that, yeah, you're paying more for, 
for lower quality, but for us it made sense as an investment. And for Edwin and for everybody working at the farm, it meant that they could see that we were loyal towards them and the loyalty we've gotten back has been tremendous. We get to cop every single plot of land on the farm before everyone else and do our selection. So I say it's a really good example of the mutual benefits of having these long-term relationships, visiting each other. Edwin had been here to visit us multiple times as well. And, and building not just one of the companies, but building it together. So I think sustainability has always been built into the DNA of our company because we had this, this fight that was the reason for starting the company, this fight of bringing more value to farmer. But over the years, we also wanted to do better on all the other aspects of running a sustainable company. 40% of the carbon emissions lies right here in the consuming countries. That's mainly because we are heating water for brewing our coffee. Years ago, we transferred all our energy usage, all our, all our electricity usage to wind power energy and thus reducing our carbon emissions by basically 40%. So for us, B Corp is probably the most serious certification that is out there. B Corp looks at your whole company because it's not just a certification, it's also a framework and a tool that any business can use to measure themselves and manage how to improve your impact on the planet. We also, as, as part of the B Corp movement, committed with what is called the Climate Collective to collectively in B Corp pledge to become carbon net zero by the year 2030. And we actually said that we want to be carbon net zero already this year. Fortunately, we are so lucky that we have a, an internal organization called Green Group that help work on this process where we have some incredibly smart, talented people either are working or have worked in the company who knows it intimately, but who have a keen interest on pursuing this agenda of becoming carbon net zero. For us, it wouldn't make sense to have really beautiful coffee shops if all the material we used wasn't sustainable and renewable. I think sustainability is, is a word that can unfortunately be very misused. And I don't think sustainability is a goal. It's not something you can say, now I've achieved full sustainability, but it's something to work towards. One of the biggest climate sinners is actually new construction. So we try to avoid, if we can, building new things but rather try to reuse what is already there. And in the case of our coffee shop in St. Hans Tor, we had to change a bunch of things around in there. We had to make a new floor and new ceiling. But working closely with a, with a local entrepreneur, we could really look closely on what kind of material do we use. So we got old stones that have been used in another factory 100 years ago, perfectly good stones that we could lay down as, as floors. For the walls, instead of using concrete or cement, which is really harmful to the environment, we use natural clay, which is actually also better for the climate inside the coffee shops because it can absorb and, and give away moisture from the air. And so in that regard, we try to look at selection of material. Who do we work with? Are there more sustainable practices? And so we constantly ask ourselves, when we have two options, which one is the better one, which one is the more sustainable one, rather than just which one is the cheaper one. For us, we have, a, we have a motivation to grow our company, both because we want to provide more opportunities of growth for our staff members, so they can see themselves in, in different positions and, and growing with the company, but also to get access to more people, allowing more people to have the opportunity to experience our kind of coffee. But most importantly, to be able to go back to the producer partners in the origin country and say, well, this year we're go going to buy 400 bags instead of 200 so that they can also see their business grow over time. We're Coffee Collective. This is our climate story. The best businesses around the world are waking up to the reality of climate change and beginning their transition to net zero emissions. The EU aims to be net zero by 2050 but sustainability pioneers like Coffee Collective will be net zero by the end of 2022. Each week on Climate Story, we bring you inspiring businesses and creators who are changing the world through sustainability. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to stay in touch. Next week, we sit down with Soren, the founder of ResRes, 
a sustainable concept store in Copenhagen.